Trigger warning. This episode includes the topics of murder, rape and child abuse, and abuse of the elderly. Listener discretion is advised. La Mata Viejitas, or Little Old Lady Killer, made headlines in Mexico for being a professional wrestler by day and serial killer by night. Though fingerprints only tied her to 16 murders, it's believed she might have killed 49 women all over the age of 70. Today, we'll discuss who La Mata Viejitas was, what motivated her to murder, and how she was finally caught on this episode of Technically a Conversation. you're listening to Technically a Conversation, a podcast where we share an interesting topic or story with each other and hope you find it interesting as well. I'm one half of your host, Jose, and I'm joined, as always, by my lovely co-host, Isela. How are you doing today? I am fine, fine, fine. Like wine, wine, wine. Andale. How are you? <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, not as good as you, but I'm doing good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's because I had a lot of tea. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, well, I guess I should start drinking more late afternoon tea. There you go. Have you watched Black Panther 2 yet? Ask me after this weekend. Okay, I'm going to shame you publicly on this podcast until you watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you already do. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Enough fucking around, Isela. Quick shout out to the queens, Elena and Erica, the Duke, Stephen B, Madtown Charity. Contra Zoom Pod Podcast and Elba. Thank you for sharing our post on your social media. Thank you guys so, so much. With all that business out of the way, ready to get started? Let's do it. Great. Let's get started. Isela, do you like a good mystery? Always. What's one of your favorite mysteries? I like to play that game, Where Did I Leave My Keys? Oh my God, what a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, do I have a favorite mystery? Um, I don't know if there's a favorite mystery. I think I always like, it's hard to re-watch a mystery movie because you kind of already know how it ends, you know? Yeah, I guess there's a certain, uh, it, it loses a little bit of rewatchability when you already know who the killer is or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even when I was young, do you remember that movie Clue? Loved that movie Clue. I actually never saw it. <laughs> it was really, it was fun. It was a fun movie. Yeah, I think when I was really young, we had HBO, so we just normally watched whatever was on there. Most of the time, it was R-rated stuff that I probably shouldn't have been watching as a kid. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> as far as me and mysteries, I was one of those annoying people that really loved the Da Vinci Code when it first came out. I loved the movie, the book. I even participated in the online game they had, which was really cool because you had to look for clues online and call phone numbers and listen to voicemails and all that stuff. Oh. It was a lot of fun. Were you annoying about the Da Vinci Code also when it came out? I was not. Have you seen it or read it? Yes, I have seen it. It was a really good movie. I mean, I enjoyed it a lot. And then I even saw whatever the sequel was. A Angels and Demons or Demons and something? Angels and Demons, yeah. Yeah, I was all excited about that one because I was like, oh my God, they have a large Hadron Collider and everything. So <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> yeah. It's going to tear apart the world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, today, Salah, we're going to solve a mystery together. I'm going to be jumping back and forth between all of our sources, but the bulk of this is from the Criminal Minds Wiki, which surprisingly has an amazingly thorough and well-researched page on the person we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Apparently, when the TV show is inspired by a real-life criminal, they profile the real criminal and list which fictional ones it influenced. Very cool. On November 25th, 2002, Maria de la Luz Gonzalez Anaya was murdered in her apartment. Maria appeared to have been brutally beaten before being strangled to death. Three months later, another woman was murdered in a similar fashion. While the police didn't feel the crimes were related, the media ran with the story and noticed there was a similar pattern, possibly dating as far back as 1998. All the victims shared a couple of things in common. They were all women that lived alone and were over the age of 70. There didn't appear to be any forced entry, so the media suspected it was someone the victims knew. 
and nothing of value appeared to be missing, so it didn't appear like theft was a motive. The media suspected all the crimes were being committed by a serial killer. They quickly named El Mata Viejitas, or the Little Old Lady Killer. The police originally feared it was media sensationalism tying the murders together, but by November 5th, 2003, Police had enough evidence and witness testimonies to believe a serial killer was involved, although they didn't make their suspicions public until 2004. Let's go over the profile the police made for El Mata Viejitas. Also, where was this at? This was in Mexico. I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, okay. No, no, that's okay. I, I was like, Mata Viejitas? Where? Who would name that? I was like, that's not Minnesota. <laughs> that's definitely not Minnesota. <laughs> okay. No, it's definitely not Minnesota. <laughs> okay, cool. So uh, it sounds like you're not familiar with this case, right? No, not at all. Okay, good. Because this case is going to get really weird really quickly. I like weird. <laughs> I'm glad. I like weird too. And I'm glad you haven't heard about it because I'm anxious to hear your reactions as we learn more about the killer. Okay. So yes, all these murders happened in Mexico. Cool. Well, I mean, not cool, but okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> it's 2003. The police haven't announced that they believe it's a serial killer yet. But internally, they're creating a profile based on eyewitness testimony. The killer was believed to be tall with broad shoulders, so they believed this person was very strong. The way some of these victims were brutally beaten and strangled seemed to corroborate that. The part that seemed a little strange at first was that the witnesses described the suspect as being dressed like a woman. Their working theory was that it might have been a transgender person or a man that was dressing as a city council nurse or social worker to gain the victim's trust. Mm -hmm. In December of 2003, the police released a wanted poster based on two eyewitness sketches of the Mata Viejitas. One was more feminine, the other one was more masculine. No mention was made of the clothing, and the wanted poster only mentioned that this was a person of interest. That got weird quick, right? Yeah. So based on that description, what are your thoughts? I don't like that they can't narrow down what this person looks like, so why even put a poster out? It's like, look at everybody. <laughs> Everyone's a suspect. <laughs> this is like the worst kind of policing ever. <laughs> yeah. And um, in our sources, there will be some pictures of the wanted posters. Oh, cool. And it pretty much looked like 90% of the people that lived in Mexico. So, <laughs> Oh, geez, Louise. Come on, people. Unless like it had like, oh, he's got like a hairy mole like, on his face or something. Like, that's cool. It's very distinctive. But you can't say, well... It's neither feminine or masculine or, you know, <laughs> that's too, that's too well, broad. <laughs> I guarantee it's going to get weirder. Okay, cool. While the Popo was releasing the person of interest posters, the murders continued and criminologists started expanding on their profile. Their theory was that the killer was a man with a quote unquote confused sexual identity who had been abused as a child by an elderly relative. The killings were a way of channeling his resentment towards innocent victims who stood in for the person who had abused him. Since the eyewitness description seemed to reinforce this theory, the city police began rounding up known transgender sex workers for questioning. 49 of these transgender sex workers were also arrested, but police were not able to hold on to them as their fingerprints didn't match any of the prints lifted from the crime scene. As you can imagine, this type of profiling caused outrage in the transgender community and the police were no closer to finding the killer, who at this point is believed to have murdered almost 50 people. I see that look on your face. 50 people is a lot. Almost 50 people. I mean, at least they rounded some people up and they tried to go in a general direction, but oh my God. And then especially if, from what you had mentioned at the beginning, one person was murdered, and then three months later, another person was murdered. And then all of a sudden, it's racked up to almost 50. How long has this, like, in what time span? This is crazy. Why? It doesn't sound like these people are moving to, like, all right, I've been trying to get this killer off the streets. <laughs> I guess the pattern was first noticed around 2003, that there was a pattern of little old ladies that were being murdered. Mm -hmm. But then once they noticed that pattern, they saw that there were all these murders of little old ladies going as far back as 1998. Oh, got it. Okay. So from 1998 to 2003, they believed that there were close to 50 people that were murdered. So that was the time span. That's so sad. Okay. Police began patrolling the areas where the killer was active and began passing out pamphlets to the elderly, along with new sketches of the assumed killer. 
The police also formally announced that they were looking for a gay man who was transgender, causing the police to get a lot of negative criticism. And I'm actually using the PC terminology here because the terminology used in some of these articles was transphobic and homophobic. Oh, well, that's lovely. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And some of these articles were kind of old, so not that it makes it better, but... You're right. No. Yeah. The police even sought the help from the French police as they believed the killer was similar to Thierry Pauline, a gay French serial killer known as the Monster of Montmartre. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lapse in murders from October of 2005 to January of 2006, making the investigators believe the killer had committed suicide. The police continued targeting and investigating the transgender community, or at least they did until 2006 when there was a break in the case. Mm. Before we go into that, though, I want to know your thoughts. Do you think it could have been a transgender person? I guess it could have been a transgender person, but it almost sounds like just a person who didn't like their own sexuality, if it's really what, like they had mentioned before, where whoever they're killing happens to be like a stand-in. No, but it wasn't towards transgender. It was just towards old ladies. I mean, it has to be someone who had issues with the parents then or something. Yeah, it's kind of strange how huh? just going based off of that, trying to make a profile of your of your own. Yeah, it's very strange. Definitely. Do you think it might have been a serial killer that was targeting these little old ladies? Or do you think the murders were unrelated? I would have to see how they were all found. Did they take all the same token? Because serial killers like to take some kind of token of like a little trophy. I would probably would need to know all that information before I could say that. That's fair. The identity of La Mata Viejitas will be revealed after this quick commercial break. Exciting, hurry! <laughs> Hi, I'm Sean McCabe. And I'm Carrie McCabe. We are, well, married, obviously, <laughs> but we're also obsessed with the darker side of things. True crime stories, alien abductions, poltergeists. If it leaves you scratching your head and keeping those lights on at night, we want to hear about it. That's why we host the podcast Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Every week, we bring our listeners a true story guaranteed to send chills down your spine, from history's most brutal serial killers to the mystery of spontaneous human combustion. Yep, lots of these stories leave unanswered questions behind, and you'll get to poke through the rubble of the evidence with a hardened skeptic and... Someone whose mind is more open to fun. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> You can find Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie wherever you get your podcasts and on social media at Ain't It Scary. Come play with us. And we're back. How was your break, Isela? Did you solve any murders during our break? No, but I'm dying to hear the rest of this because you know me. Once you tell me something, I'm like, oh my God. Did I go over any clues that I might have missed? Did I <laughs> start to like ruminate in my own uh, crazy thoughts? <laughs> okay, so you didn't solve any murders during our break. Did you commit any? I just, uh, no, not at all. <laughs> no, I just thought too much. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> That's a weird way to get people to confess. <laughs> well, I thought if I asked that as a very casual question, maybe you would confess. Yeah, fair. <laughs> now, you and I weren't the only ones to have a break. As I mentioned earlier, the Popo finally got their big break in 2006. On January 25th, 2006, an apartment tenant witnessed the person running out of the murder scene of apartment landlady Ana Maria de los Reyes Alfaro, who was strangled to death with a stethoscope and was arrested by a passing police patrol. The identity of La Mata Viejitas was finally known and it was none other than... Well, before I reveal the identity, <laughs> have you ever stayed up late at night watching TV? Yes, definitely. Okay, amongst the infomercials for useless junk and commercials for sports betting, reverse mortgages, payday loans, and other predatory loans targeting our most vulnerable populations, what's one thing that you're sure to encounter late at night on TV if you're not streaming? Uh, okay, that's, that last part is all I do. So you're going to have to clue me in. That's all I do. Is... You're 12 and you're watching TV late at night. Okay. 
So you said other than infomercials and... And predatory loans. Mm, when I was 12, I used to see a lot of that. Call Miss Cleo. <laughs> <laughs> Call me now. <laughs> she was great. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe like workout gear or something. The correct answer is professional wrestling. And our killer was none other than Mexican professional wrestler Juana Barraza. Or perhaps you might know her by her stage name of La Dama del Silencio. Professional wrestler by day, serial killer by night. Wow. I don't know if either of those are respectable. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm kidding. That's so awful. <laughs> you should probably cut that up. Um, oh my God, that's so awful. Is it like the steroid thing that like got her to snap or something? Oh, we're going to examine that. Okay, cool. La Dama del Silencio would translate to the Lady of Silence for our non-Spanish speaking super friends. Were you totally expecting that twist or did I take you by surprise? That's very surprising because I feel like if you have a professional wrestling job in Mexico, it's as close to a celebrity status as, you know, I mean, it's not like they're going to treat you like Luis Miguel or, you know, Chente or something like that. But they'll probably treat you better. That's right. <laughs> but uh, that's a, a huge sport out there, you know, so I would imagine they get paid pretty well and it comes with its perks of like oh we'll let you come on through skip any lines and whatever you would think somebody would want to baby that profession and kind of like protect it a little bit and not do some crazy go on a killing spree were you expecting it to be a woman um no usually when i hear serial killers i you know i mean there are female serial killers for sure but you know we definitely are not even close to half of it yeah, yeah, you're right. It's usually men. Mm -hmm. After Barraza was arrested, the police did a search of her home and found that she had a trophy room filled with newspaper clippings, objects she would take from her victims, and an altar to Jesus Malverde and Santa Muerte. So let's dissect these items a little bit. The newspaper clippings are significant and maybe a little incriminating because Barraza was illiterate, so it didn't make a lot of sense that she would have them unless it was a symbol of pride for her. Like when your kid comes out in the newspaper for winning third place in the city science fair, or when your grandpa gets arrested for lewd and disorderly conduct again. <laughs> yeah, proud moments. <laughs> <laughs> the objects taken from the victims were items of little to no value, primarily religious trinkets. So it didn't appear that she stole them for financial gain. Are you familiar with who Jesus Valverde and Santa Muerte are? No. I mean, Santa Muerte, I think I've only heard it as like, you know, this kind of cult type of idea of like a black magic kind of thing. Jesus Malverde is celebrated by some as a folk saint. He's seen as a Robin Hood-like figure who supposedly stole from the rich and gave to the poor. Although it's claimed that he lived from January 15th, 1870 to May 3rd, 1909, there is no evidence that such a person ever lived and cannot be historically verified. Nonetheless, those that celebrate him, amongst others, are drug cartels and drug traffickers, bandits, thieves, smugglers, and people in poverty. There's a lot of folklore and legends surrounding this character, and I might do an episode on him one day. Santa Muerte is short for Nuestra Señora de la Santa Muerte, and is also seen as a folk saint or female deity in Mexican Catholicism and Mexican neo-paganism. She's associated with healing, protection, and safe delivery to the afterlife by those that patronize her. Despite leaders of the Catholic Church and evangelical movements condemning her, her popularity has only continued to grow since the turn of the 21st century. The key takeaway of both of these figures on her altar is that they're both commonly venerated by criminals. There's also some pictures that I'm going to put of both of these two, um, I guess, entities that are from Wikipedia. So if you want to see what they look like, uh, you can take a look. Oh, wow. Well. That'll be in the show notes. After the arrest of Juana Barraza, the police made her pose next to the eyewitness sketches that had been made of her, as well as a bust that was created from the sketches to mislead the public into thinking that the police had been on the right trail all along. The reality is that a week prior to her arrest, Barraza had been at a local police station, although the details of why were not provided, and had even appeared on TV doing an interview about wrestling without arousing any suspicion. In 2008, Barraza was linked to 30 murders, although it's believed she might have murdered 49 people. 
but was only found guilty of 16 murders and 12 robberies, as those were the only crimes that could be tied to her through fingerprint evidence. Oh, okay. You just answered my question. (laughs) Okay. She's only ever confessed to one of those murders, the one where she was caught red-handed. Would you like to take a guess, a gander, if you will, at how many years in prison she was sentenced to? I'm assuming that they probably went very light on her sentence because she's a celebrity-ish. Um, but they caught her definitely for 16, you said, of the 38? 16 she was found guilty of. She was tied to 30 of the murders, but they didn't have evidence for the other ones. But the belief is that she might have murdered 49 people. And of course, she only confessed to one. So it's kind of hard for them to really tie her to more than the 16 where they actually do have evidence. Okay. So based off of 16, I'm sure it's going to be something ridiculously short, unfortunately. Let me let me guess like 10 years. The correct answer is 759 years. Oh, yay. <laughs> All right. Good. See, see my um my cynicism or what's it called? <laughs> That's lovely. But is she still in jail? Well, the next question is, would you like to take a guess at how many of those years she will actually serve? Oh, oh no, I don't like. See, this is that should never be the follow up question. That's what you get. Then that's what you serve. You know what I'm saying? Um, Let's see. She. Well, I mean, should be for the rest of her life, I guess. How old was she? How was her average life expectancy? 60 years? Another 30 years? <laughs> You're actually close. Okay. <laughs> 50. Oh, wow. That's... In Mexico, the longest prison sentence you can serve is 50 years. So she'll be paroled in 2058 at the age of 100 years young, as you would say, Isela. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. She'll be ready to kill again at 100. <laughs> Girl's going to look like Santa Muerte by the time she gets out. Yeah, for sure. She will know Santa Muerte intimately. (laughs) (laughs) So did she ever mention why? We're going to go into that. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and Tarantino this shit and see how we arrived here. Okay. Our protagonist was born Juana Dayanara Barraza Samperio in Hidalgo, Mexico in 1957. Her father was a police officer. Her mother was an alcoholic sex worker. Three months after Barraza was born, her mother abandoned her husband, Juana's father, to have an adulterous relationship with her own stepfather, (gasps) in turn also becoming Juana's stepfather. Oh my goodness. Okay. Wow. It sounds like a damn Pornhub video, huh? It's so gross. It's so gross. (laughs) This is where the story takes a dark turn. At the age of 12, Barraza's mother pimped Juana out for three beers to a man that would go on to abuse her for four years. She became pregnant twice by the man at the ages of 13 and 16, (gasps) but both pregnancies resulted in miscarriages. So awful. Okay. Yeah. To say that she had a fucked up childhood is a massive understatement. For sure. Well, now I can see why she's killing old ladies. Yeah, definitely. Barraza left Mexico City when her mother died of cirrhosis and was in several failed marriages. From those marriages, she had four kids, but her firstborn died in a gang shooting at the age of 24. During the 80s and 90s, she started touring Central Mexico as La Dama del Silencio, or the Lady of Silence, an alias that referenced her own shy and silent personality. During this time, she also had numerous odd jobs to make ends meet. After the birth of her fourth child in 1995, she began to steal from shops and homes just to stay afloat. After retiring from wrestling in 2000, her situation became desperate. Now, this is a part that didn't really make sense to me. She wasn't really stealing anything of value. One of the sources said that her trophies were primarily crucifixes, Bibles, rings, and images of saints. At first, police didn't even notice anything missing and didn't think the crimes were financially motivated since items of value were usually left behind. So that doesn't make any sense to me. Why go through all that trouble if you're not going to be walking out with bags of money? Maybe it's like the uh, office space type of thing where you're going to steal little pennies here and there. So it adds up to a lot. But if you take big things, they're going to automatically assume it's theft. But if you take little things, they won't notice. Yeah, I mean, but if you're already going to go through the trouble of murdering somebody, 
That's just the sport part. That's for fun. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think that's a quote of the podcast. Murdering, it's for fun. No, yeah. That, <laughs> that, for funsies. <laughs> what do you do on your time off, Isela? Ah, go murder people. <laughs> Definitely not. No, no, no. <laughs> but I would imagine anyway, like, that's probably something she did more for psychological reasons. And then she's like, ah, oh, since I'm here, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That part didn't make sense to me. I think that there's more to it that, you know, she hasn't confessed to and that the police wasn't able to figure out. During questioning, Barasa only confessed to having strangled one woman, the one where she was caught. But like we said earlier, her fingerprints tied her to 16. She stated she committed the crime she confessed to out of a sense of anger and hatred at elderly women due to her feelings toward her mother, who was an alcoholic and pimped her at the age of 12. Barasa claimed that she wasn't the only person behind the killings, but according to the police, Barasa acted alone. Barasa would gain the trust of her victims in various ways. Sometimes she would offer to help them bring in groceries or would ask for cleaning work. Other times she would dress up in white and pretend to be a nurse or social worker and would offer free checkups or offered to give them information about benefits. This is all awful, but the part that I shamefully loved was that eventually she was able to acquire a genuine nurse's uniform and would cosplay as a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess if you're going to let a stranger in, I can kind of see why these people were like, well, I haven't had a checkup in a long time or something. You know what I mean? Now that makes sense why the lady had the stethoscope. Yeah, and the fact that she was cosplaying as a nurse people were more willing to trust her. Yeah, makes complete sense. And how sad. <laughs> yeah, but I did love that she was cosplaying. And you know me, I love disguises. So I thought that part was so cool. I think that kind of calls back to her professional wrestling career as wrestling is so theatrical. Her wrestling costume was very flamboyant too with the pink and white and her butterfly mask. It'll be the cover art for this episode. Cool. So time to go to the not so cool part. Okay. After getting her victim's trust, she would wait until the victim was distracted and either strangle them with her hands or would use her stethoscope or anything she would find lying around the house, like a cord or stockings. Those were usually left at the scene of the crime. If the victim was not distracted, she would usually first attack the person, many times using moves she learned as a wrestler, then strangle them. That sucks. Using her training again. You know what I mean? That's awful. It's like, all right, I learned how to kick ass. Now, do I use it for good or for evil? Obviously, she chose the wrong one. Yeah, definitely. And that's about all I have to say about that. Very interesting. Never heard this lady before. I'm glad that she served 50 years at least. I mean, or is serving, I should say, 50 years. That seems at least long enough. Yeah, she's probably not going to make it. She'll be 100, so. Right. But I know when you say it's, that you find something very interesting, that means that you don't find it interesting. Sure. We'll go with that. I'm going to stop fighting it. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> well, not only did super friend Madtown Charity share one of our posts this week on her socials, she also wrote to let us know that we were one of her favorite podcasts and looks forward to our show every week. Aw, that warms my heart. Thank you. She said that every week is a wonderful surprise for show topics. She Aww. said she discovered us from when we were on the Spooky Tales and has listened to all of our episodes and is always spreading the word. She also wants us to get a Patreon so that she can support us there as well. Oh, we love that. Thank you. <laughs> so kind. Yes, thank you so much, Madtown Charity, for your super kind words and helping us to spread the word. It really means a lot to us, and we really appreciate you. We could use all the help we can get. Definitely. So, Madtown Charity, you're our super friend of the week. <laughs> You know, that song is also a little like Elvis, suspicious -y, like very like, right? it's kind of Viva Vegas kind of <laughs> feels. Yeah, definitely uh, coked out Elvis vibes for sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I put a very specific picture in my head. <laughs> I was just thinking a little chubby, happy Elvis, but now he's all strung out. <laughs> he's all stumbling. <laughs> yeah, all sweating all over the place. I pobrecito. I was thinking that was from all the lights. What do you mean? <laughs> I think that was probably due to the cocaine, even though he claimed oh. not to take drugs, but we know how they found his body. 
I was going to say, I think we all know the <laughs> autopsy. <laughs> Either way, he was a hunk of hunk of burning love. Hey, he was like the, uh, I remember watching some of his old movies and I was like, oh my God, he was really like the original hottie. Well, him and like James Dean. I was like, Jade. Yeah. Interesting. As you would say. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> On that high note, we hope that you enjoyed the show and you join us again next week. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a review, tell a friend, and subscribe wherever fine podcasts are sold. Mm -hmm. Follow us on the socials at GreetingsTAC, email us at GreetingsTAC at gmail.com, or leave us a voicemail at 915-317-6669 if you have a story to share with us. Or if you just want to say hello. That'll work too. <laughs>